This show contains movie spoilers and swearing. The only way to avoid finding yourselves on the front pages is for one of you to kill Wadsworth. Now. Every person in this room has the perfect motive. Stand back! For murder. What do you mean? Murder. But only one of these suspects is the murderer. Is it the timid Mr. Green? Ah, why are you screaming? Because I'm frightened of what? Screaming! Or the militant Colonel Mustard? If I was the killer, I would kill you next. Huh? Except half. Half. Mrs. White, who helped her husband on his way. Well, it's a matter of life after death. Now that he's dead, I have a life. Ah. Miss Scarlet, who's helped many men along the way. Practice makes perfect. Huh. Professor Plum, who's looking for a way. I'm looking, I'm looking. Mrs. Peacock. I have absolutely no idea what we're doing here, but I am determined to enjoy myself. Or did the butler do it? No. 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 Paramount Pictures invites you to an evening of mystery. Medicine, medicine, medicine. Murder. This is getting quite serious. And madness. <laughs> In the movie that makes a scene of the crime. So Clue. It's not just a game anymore. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Bite Size Cinema. I'm your host, RJ McCready, and for this episode, I'm going to be taking you back to a year in 1985 to have a look at the cult classic Who Done It comedy Clue. And joining me for the show today is Court Sipes from Cinema Sipes Podcast. Court, welcome back to Bite Size Cinema. Hey, RJ. Thanks for having me back. Now, you had told me when we were messaging back and forth about this that when you thought of Clue, you thought of me specifically for doing this. Uh, yeah. to cover it and it's kind of interesting because you're probably the third i think now podcaster that also said when i think of clue i think of court psyops <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was um it was the same as when i invited you on the show for uh, return of the living dead um it, yeah there's some there's some films that kind of make you think of other people and i i think i remember listening to your show where you've brought up clue and you said it was one of your favourite movies with your wife, I think, or something like that. I know, I know, you, you and your wife like the Burbs as well. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this sort of like dark, awkward '80s comedy thing is sort of like our bread and butter. Yeah. Um, particularly like for her, um, the dark, twisted stuff is my sense of humour, and then the sort of wacky, weird things that they do, particularly in the Burbs, is like it's like her bread and butter. And actually, she introduced me to the Burbs. It was like her her movie like she was obsessed with it for like a really long time and when we first started dating it came on cable and we caught like the back half of the movie and it was the first time i ever watched it i watched it with her and like it was right around the part where uh he has the nightmare about the neighbors <laughs> wielding chainsaws and doing the satan is good satan is our pal kind of stuff and i was like this is my kind of comedy and she's like yeah this part's a little weird but it gets you know cute again here at the end and i'm like i, I don't i don't want cute i want this this is great <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know we, we just started talking about those kinds of things that we've we found various movies like over the years because we've been together for over half our lives now yeah and clue is one of the ones that her and i saw billions of times as kids and it was prevalent uh on cable over here uh, like it, we would play network tv on like a saturday matinee kind of movie when they didn't want to play anything else on saturday and football was over so the the you know like a local TV station would just play Clue in the middle of the afternoon. You you could catch it too, or it would be on TBS a hundred times. Or I think the thing that her and I both saw it the most was when it played HBO over and over again because HBO just repeated everything back in the early '80s. That's how it got the name Hey Beastmasters on. <laughs> 
Yeah, when I think of Beastmaster, I think of either Ricky Morgan or uh, Matthew Tangent. <laughs> See, it's it's what yeah, that it goes back to that question that you asked me. What made me made you think of you know this film? And it does, you know. Sometimes when you watch films, you think of other people. Um, <laughs> it's just funny how that happens. But um, the funny thing, you know, with, the yeah. Beastmaster actually is something the wife and I share as well. Whenever right. uh, Vinegar, Vinegar Syndrome, I think it was, yeah, it was Vinegar Syndrome who released a 4K UHD disc of Beastmaster, and it was being remastered and everything. They found like a bunch of the original negatives and everything and it got super cleaned up i was messaging my wife telling her that they were making this and that it was getting done and it was going to happen and she got more excited than what i did and i was like don't worry honey i already have it pre-ordered like she loves that movie because she grew up watching it too which is exactly i think where all of podcasting comes from is this is all stuff you grew up loving and now you just want to talk about it with somebody else that absolutely loves it too yeah i think um what you're saying there is you kind of got like a little bit of um, a sort of happy medium in a film that you can watch. Like, you know, you said The Burbs. I see The Burbs as like a, it's a bit of an entry level to horror. It's not it's not a direct horror movie, but it's got horror elements in it. Um, but it's something at the same time you can watch with either your wife, your girlfriend or your family or your kids. Um, as, as opposed to something like an Argento movie or... Uh, something John Carpenter you know it's you're either gonna go into the horror realms but if someone doesn't like horror you can say well we can watch this movie together um but Clue what I found with Clue is I watched it when I was a kid with with my family with my parents and this was before we you had Sky TV and YouTube and social media um and I watched it on TV and I thought it was a really good film, loved it, um, that's why I still love it today, but I didn't realise the actual cult following of this movie until the last sort of five years, when um, I started hearing everybody talking about it, like yourself, you know, and fellow Legion podcasters, and I thought, wow, there's actually quite a lot of people that like this film, so I was quite surprised. Yeah, it's interesting how movies are like that, where, uh, especially like this film, and I know that it did moderately okay at the box office, mm. and it wasn't like anything that was such a huge hit but a film like this that's becomes a cult classic it it's something that just it finds its audience over time or the audience just kind of manages to sort of fall backwards into it and i think it's similar to like the christmas story it's just like this becomes part of who you were because it was just always on as you were growing up and you know in your formative years it's just sort of somewhat in the background you would at least clue or, or something along those lines and the wife and I definitely became super obsessed with it. And I think what you were saying about the com- comedy sort of gives you a, a backward way into multiple audiences being able to enjoy something that they maybe wouldn't have gone for before. And Clue is definitely your straight up murder mystery kind of Agatha Christie uh, movie, but they do a spin and a parody on it uh, through the sort of lens of the game, which I guess is known. Is it, is it Cluedo over there for you folks as well? Or is it only in Scotland that they call it Cluedo? <laughs> it's funny you say is it only in Scotland. <laughs> um, no, they, we, we call it Cluedo here as well. It's, um, yeah. What do they call it? Is it they call it Cluedo in Scotland as well, don't they? Is that a Tunk, Duncan well, McLeish reference here, is it? Yeah, yeah. Dunk, I've always heard Duncan just call it straight up Cluedo. Like, even when he's talking about the movie, he calls the movie Cluedo. Because I guess they released the movie as Cluedo over there too, did they? Yes, they did. Um, they, well, they released it as Clue, but they always referenced it as based on the movie. Based on Cluedo. Oh, sorry, okay. based on the game um, Cluedo, which I don't know anybody that doesn't know that game. But it, it's still to this day, I, I play it. Um, sort of during Christmas time. Um, oh yeah, that that makes sense. Like with the the big uh, open manor and things like that, that you would uh, I could see where that would feel very Christmas to play. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's that type of you know. It's it kind of goes with the movie. It's one of the reasons why I like the film because of the sort of isolation and it's cold outside. You kind of need to play Cluedo during the winter time because it creates that atmosphere. Get some candles. Get some wine. Um, gets gets really cozy. You, you also want like a nice burning fire. <laughs> well, that's just uh, a good setting for board games and romance or something, you know. It's a good setting for anything in my house. <laughs> Much the same <laughs> as yours, you know. I hear the. Um, it's another thing that I hear as well. 
amongst fellow podcasters, especially us guys, isolation. For some reason, <laughs> us guys just want to be in a you know cabin somewhere where it's snowing outside and isolation. It's there's something about that. I think it's because you become disconnected from the actual world. I think that's got something to do with it. <laughs> well, yeah, there's there's that, and then some of us suffer from anxiety. Yes, yeah, and other issues like that, and. It's just much easier to hide away from the world and basically be able to connect with people remotely as you decide to, mm. um, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, and those of us that live in our head like that tend to love fantasy worlds like this with, with Blue and Pluto, however you want to put it, you know, it's just kind of how our brain works. Uh, yeah. I was kind of curious, like how many versions of Clue have you, or do you currently own? Cause everybody I think owns at least one. My, is my theory or has owned at least one or has had the board game in their house or there's pieces of it that are still around because they maybe destroyed it like a psychopath as they were kids yeah that's a good question well i had what i think was the original basic clue um where the pieces were like different colors and the characters were referenced differently and then i've got the modern board game which is slightly different i think some of the characters are named differently so you've got the same sort of colours, but it's been brought up to date. So Miss um, Mrs. White used to be the cook in the kitchen, whereas now I think they brought it more towards like a sort of 20s, 20-year-old 20 sort of audience, so the characters on the board game are a little bit younger. So you can see how it's changed throughout the generations to fit, um, to fit the generation, I suppose you could say. Um, but yeah, I well, think I, I've already got I, I own the most Generation X uh, clue game ever. Go on. It's a Simpsons-based one, so it takes oh, place I in see. Burns' mansion, yeah. and it's who killed Mr. Burns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, I get that. I suppose I suppose you could do it. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I, I mean, going back to... It's, it's literally the same. Like, everything else is the same. They just throw in the Simpsons characters dressed as, like, Professor Plum or Colonel Mustard and all of that. And they're just, it's its basically like a Treehouse of Horrors, only they do Clue, right. and then it's a board game from that. It's basically how they did it, and it's great. And Mr. Burns is Mr. Body, is he? <laughs> Every time. I believe so, yeah. Because yeah. um, even, uh, I, th I think that, it's been a really long time since I busted it open, but I think that Smithers is actually Professor Plum. Right. You know, and, and things like that. And I'm pretty sure that Homer's mustard and... Marge is, I think, Scarlet. I can't really fully remember. But, I mean, even Lisa and Bart are involved as well. And I think it, it stems from that whole, like, who shot Mr. Burns idea that they, they did this clue mystery thing. And the wife and I just found that, like, in a discount bin. And we're like, yeah, this is the most Generation X version of Clue. We need to own this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I mean, going, I mean, talking about this is probably a good time to bring this up. I mean, the actual film is based on the board game and the actual setting in the movie itself all the rooms tie up with how it is on on the board game itself so the library will lead to the uh, i'm just making this up say like the dining room or something like that how it does on the actual game itself which is clever for a little bit of um uh trivia there um, well, the room designs even look very similar to how they used to draw them on the board game, like yeah. with the woodworking and everything like that. Now, granted, it's based on just a giant oversized mansion, but they made sure that they ran into a room that was an atrium just so you could see that, hey, it's possible someone could have died in the atrium like you always see. Yeah, and, you know, when I first watched the film, I thought this must be an actual house somewhere, you know, in the in America. But it's, it's, it turns out it's actually a, um, a stage in Hollywood and it's, I think this house has been built just for purely for the movie but it's an incredible job because it just feels none of it feels fake it, it feels like a real stately home were the exteriors that they shot also a stage did you did you do, re, do the research to find that because if that was a stage that felt like they were actually outside and they must have spent some money to get the wind effects and all that other stuff when he's coming in and greeting the dogs and all that yeah exactly well it, yeah it is and they used it for the tv series Di Di dynasty afterwards as a bit of trivia so it's the same house as they used for that tv show oh wow okay mm. so that that totally makes sense and having it on a stage set like that they can literally control everything so even the way the storm hits with the gags and all of that it makes sense now yeah um I, 
the more I learn about this movie, the, the more fascinated I am with how they actually made it the way that they made it. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And the other thing is, I mean, I've watched this film quite a few times, and even when I, when, even when I rewatch it, I still can't work out who's who's done it throughout the movie. It's very clever. It's like you've watched it, but you you, you might know in a few places, but it's very clever. How it's very rewatchable, and you still trying to think oh how did they do that and how did they do this it's, it's much the same as um, say like the thing crikey sorry people i bring that film up every time <laughs> but um you could almost it's... have an alarm go off every time you talk <laughs> about it because it's like your favorite movie <laughs> yeah rj's managed to i'm sure if i was talking about lassie i could probably bring up some sort of thing reference there <laughs> with that. Oh, all you got to do is just go with the dog it's like, well, you know imagine if a good dog like lassie got infected by the thing how much worse it would be Boom, oh my god there, there you go that's it yeah that's it <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All all um all roads leads leads to the thing. But again, I mean, uh, there is also the isolation here with this film, and there is also the, you know, the, obviously the thing is basically a who done it, Ag- 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 Agatha Christie, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, like I a ten little that. Indians with demon possession almost uh, the way that it works. Yeah, exactly. And the other thing I like about Clue is the way that they've mixed up. Obviously, Wandsworth, he's a. Uh, depending on which ending you see, he is kind of like the investigator. He's the instigator. He's the actual person who's caused the crime. Like I say, depending on what. But I like the way that um, you don't have any sort of direct detective in this film like you do with like uh, Murder on the Orient Express. But I like the way that they've kind of mixed that into the movie. Um, it's. And and Tim Curry does an incredible job, doesn't he, as Wandsworth? Well, and the game clue itself is you're the other party guests trying to prove that you didn't do it. Yeah. Um. So the way that they incorporated that into the movie to the point where they even have Michael McKean every five seconds is green screaming, I didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> like when everything like somewhat slightly anywhere comes near pointing to him or people just happen to look up at him while they're talking, he screams it out. <laughs> it's freaking hilarious. I didn't realize just how much it is until I was fixated on him this yeah. time around watching. <laughs> but it's like this like whole motif thing where just somebody throws a sideways glance at him. He's like, I didn't do it. <laughs> For like every stupid little thing. Yeah, he, he he's that guy, isn't he? He's he's kind of like the sort of Jack Burton, isn't he? You know, nothing goes right for him, but <laughs> sits sits on the table, doesn't he? And then the table sort of just crumbles, doesn't it? He falls on his ass. <laughs> yeah, Michael McKean did some really good pratfalls in this, or stumbles, or, or something like that. I I'm so used to his brilliant wordplay that he does later on in his career as he becomes a aged actor and comedian. That I forget just how funny of a physical comedian he was in his youth, like this film. Yeah, and um, also like the I love the characters in this film, and I love the actors that are playing those characters, and I think everybody does a really good job of portraying that, and particularly uh, Christopher Lloyd uh, playing Professor Plum. He's a bit of a pervert. Uh, oh, he's more than a pervert. Well, <laughs> he's what you're, he's what they call on your side of the pond a freaking sex pest. Because <laughs> yeah. he's he's unwantingly advancing towards just about anything that's even vaguely female. Yeah, because he's looking at Yvette's breast, isn't he? And he's like, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. <laughs> it's like, um, but it's it is like uh, Doctor Brown, isn't it? it, it the, there's some Doctor Brown elements that come out. Oh my god, he's used the gun. It's a gun, and you know, he just sort of comes out with that very sort of quick talking that he does as uh, you know, Doc Brown. You know. <laughs> well, you could even hear that in the brief little stint of some of the things that he was yelling and screaming in uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It's just sort of like the affectation of that actor when he gets excited. But unfortunately, yes, Professor Plum does have a few moments that it feels like Doc Brown, which makes Doc Brown's relationship with Marty much more sus to you when you oh. see him in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the thing. I think that's probably what makes this more 
of um, more rewatchable because I don't think the audience necessarily watched this for the first time and thought, oh, Christopher Lloyd is playing Doc Brown because Back to the Future, I think, came out the same year. Um, and I don't know how these two were released, whether this was released before Back to the Future. Um, I've seen this movie so many times and there is always something new that I noticed. Mm. For instance, I've watched it so many times and the soup slurping yep. joke that they make with Peacock and Plum where he makes a slurping noise that's terrible and then she like side eyes him about how rude and uncouth he is and then makes a much worse one and they cut to the other side of the table and everybody on the other side of the table is staring at her because of the weird slurpy soup noise that they make i never paid attention to that until last night and i, I don't know why i fixated on it and laughed like a lot yeah might have been because i was high i don't know <laughs> well i think it's um i think when you when you uh, when you're doing notes for a podcast you kind of look at it in a sort of critic type of way um, you kind of focus a little bit more on those that. Um, it's like the bit when uh, they all turn up outside in the cars and you look at the cars and the cars are all coloured to the pieces on the chessboard. So Colonel, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Colonel Mustard's obviously, um, you know, like the orange car, the red car. Um, but what, what I do like is the characters are, you know, Miss Scarlet, but they're not obviously... Miss Scarlet doesn't turn up in all, like, red... Um, I kind of like the way they just sort of do a little bit of a spin on that. And Miss White turns up in a black outfit, but she's got like um, a white lining. And it, it's just a very sort of clever spin. Well, I think Mrs. White, too, uh, the paleness of her skin was what was supposed to be the representation for the white. Because even the vehicle she traveled in wasn't white. Yeah. It was every everything about her screams the opposite of being mrs white the way that she's set up because she seems like a very dark very twisted character and i think they're just having a play or just having some fun with the name in her case um because madeline khan just steals the movie for every freaking frame that she's on screen yeah exactly, <laughs> she just yeah. owns this movie because obviously she's worked with mel brooks i think mel brooks had some something to do i think he had the opportunity to direct this film because um, obviously she was in Young Frankenstein and she in Blazing Saddles um, but talking about the directors and the writers um, John Landis had something to do with the screenplay I think didn't he from American Werewolf in London obviously yeah he did um, he co-wrote it with the uh, uh, Jonathan I can't remember the last name but I think it was Jonathan Lynn Is Jonathan, that, does that jo sound right Jonathan Lynn's a director yeah that's it yeah so he and uh he and uh, Landis did kind of co-write it as well. Um, I, you know, Deborah Hill was yeah. the producer on this when she had worked with John Carpenter. So there's, I think she had kind of, was she developing it for Carpenter and then Carpenter backed out or something like that? No, I don't think Carpenter was involved. I think um, Deborah Hill. This was after their split uh, up as a partnership for working then, huh? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's right. Um after she finished her work on, she worked on Escape, Escape from New York. And then I think that was the last film that she did with Carpenter. Um, and then she kind of went away and away. But then when you think about it, Deborah Hill, it, it, there's a lot to be said about Deborah Hill. She's a very talented producer. Because you think of all the best films that I think that Carpenter has done, she's been, she's been attached to. Um, and then she went on to go and do, obviously, this film and... She did adventures in babysitting as well. <laughs> um, so she did. She went on to go and do some really good stuff. Yeah, she kind of outpaced what she was doing, even with Carpenter. Um, when the two split up, I mean, she kind of ended up making some really amazing work, and Carpenter's work started to falter a little bit without her. Yeah, that's I mean, right. she's mm -hmm. she's kind of more responsible for the aesthetics and um, the way that Carpenter's, the feel of Carpenter's films, then I think uh, people really realize mm -hmm. um, because they're distinctly different after she splits on Escape from New York. His stuff is distinctly different. Absolutely. And it, yeah. it, it, it loses the focus I think it had under her. And he starts to meander a little bit with his movies like uh, They Live and things like that. No, don't get me wrong. Absolutely fucking love everything Carpenter's ever done. I'm not trying to disparage it or anything, but you can definitely feel the difference. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, because uh, you, you, it's like Dean Cundy, isn't it? The uh, cinematographer. In, I mean, we're sort of going on to Carpenter here a little bit, but you can see how he is responsible for... T- it's all these elements of fine-tuning, isn't it? If you're surrounded by people who've got an awful lot of talent, that's how your end product's going to go out. And I know what you mean with uh, films like uh, They Live. You can just see that... Thinking about it now, I wonder what would happen if Deborah Hill was attached to this. Well, if she just might just look at the final product and say, oh, maybe we could just do this. Um, just tune it up a little bit, perhaps. But um, yeah, I get- She seems to be more like uh, a producer that finds a way to make it happen the way that the director wants the thing to happen. Yep. Uh, she just really seems to be quite adept at doing that as far as producers go. And that's, I mean, that's what you want, especially in filmmaking. You want a producer who can find a way to make the thing happen the way that their director wants this particular thing to look and or or seem, but also do it in such a way so that the budget is stretched out. And, and I, I really feel like Deborah Hill learned that, you know, through the, the early years and the lean years with uh, Carpenter and then took that into the big productions. The same thing with Cundy. I mean, look what Cundy did after he and Carpenter, not necessarily just split ways, but when Cundy started getting picked up by other people, I mean, he's done some of the greatest movies of all time. He's been a cinematographer for it. And and, and he's done some of the most uh, well-received and well-loved movies of all time, too. Like, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Jurassic Park, but I can appreciate what it is, but he shot it. Yeah. (laughs) Because he's really good at shooting in low-level light and working with special effects because he's been doing that for, like, decades before that even came along. So I'm really not that shocked that, you know, these people that all work together kind of go on and shape the movie industry in their specific fields because they really learn what they're doing on those low-budget movies like that. And I feel like Clue would not have been the same movie had they not had Deborah Hill to basically stretch the dollar and, and make it work the, the way that she does her magic. Because she does. Everything that she's involved with feels like it's way more expensive than what it ended up being. And uh, while Clue may not have been the huge success runaway-wise that they were hoping for, I think it certainly did well enough that, I mean, it continued all of their careers and, and it kind of was able to springboard off of everybody because it had a cult following <laughs> very quickly, even though it didn't do well in theaters itself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is like that in Hollywood, isn't it? I, I suppose you could say that it's almost like you signed us, you sold with the devil or something. Your film will, won't do very well commercially uh, when it first comes out, but it will become a cult classic. Um, and it's almost like films that are cult classics are typically films that haven't done very well when they've been released, and then later on people find them, don't they? You know? And I think that's... Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a funny... It's a funny thing that happens, but it's a thing that does happen in movies in general. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you look back at Clue and the actors, they probably come away at the time and thought, ah, oh, you must be so disheartened, you know, to think that you've made this film and it hasn't done very well. And then later on you go, actually, um, I'm really proud that I'm part of that film because it's left a, you know, a legacy. <laughs> it just gets better and better and better. Apparently, Tim Curry had a pin that was um, the letters T I T, like with like little little dots to indicate that it was uh, 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 it represented a phrase that it was you know just kind of like an, an acronym or whatever. And uh, he used to tell producers if they commented on it that he is terrific in turkeys and that's what that pin represents. I don't know if that was a joke that he I just heard him say it one time in an interview. That's what he does. Um, it, and it was like he had a whole string of them in the '90s where he was like a villain in all these terrible '90s movies. Or would, you know, just show up and he would be like, yes, I may be in these movies that people don't like as much, but essentially I'm great in them and people will always remember me. And he's like, I'm terrific in turkeys. That's what I do best. And that's why I have the pin, you know, and he just he goes on this like little diatribe about it. And he's not ashamed of it didn't seem like at least in this interview that he was ashamed of anything that he had did, even the failures and all the stuff that people would scoff at and didn't like. Because, as he says, he is terrific in everything I've ever seen him in. He's always giving his all. And I feel like all of these actors, while they may have been possibly disappointed in the results of how the movie initially turned out and they probably wanted a bigger box office, 
in the long run, when you're involved in a cult film like this, you have staying power where people specifically seek you out yeah. because you were in a movie that they were obsessed with. And mm. that's what I was talking about with the springboard effect that this movie would have with its cult following. Exactly that, because I was talking to someone um, at work about this, and they were saying, oh, RJ, you know, what's your next next podcast? Because they call me Captain Podcast at work, you know. <laughs> and uh, Just getting called Captain Anything at work is kind of cool. It is, yeah, I'll take that. And um, I said I was doing the film Clue, and I, I, I immediately just came out and said, you probably haven't heard of it. And I said, yeah, I love that film, it's great. And we had a really good conversation about it and joking about all the parts in the movie, you know. Um, and I just said, like, what we're saying now, it's like, this is a film that didn't do very well commercially, but I'm still talking about it. It's become a cult classic. But I said, now, I've been to go and see a film, like, recently at the cinema that's been made for $100 million or $200 million. It's got all these big stars in it. And I've walked out of the cinema, and I won't out which film this was. But I've gone, that hasn't done anything for me at all. I can't even remember what happened, you know. And I don't think I'll be talking about this film in years to come like I am this film. Do you know what I mean? It's just weird how things are. You know, you get a film. I don't know why, but I suspect it's a Christopher Nolan movie you're talking Uh, about. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ, called you know me that well. Yeah, there you go. So here we go. There's a, there's a mini investigation that's happened there. You've you've just completely seen through me there, Cool. <laughs> Let's just call it my intuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I watched it uh, in my front room uh, on <laughs> a DVD player with a beer. There you go. That's that's me. I'm I'm done. If we're, if we're doing Cluedo. <laughs> it's uh, well it's, I, e- it's either uh it's either that or sack snyder whichever one <laughs> right I, I totally get what you're saying but yeah. uh this movie actually is infinitely rewatchable and it definitely as i had mentioned before is rewarding for rewatchability and rj you and i could sit here all day and just be like two plus one plus two plus you know and just go on and on mm. and on Plus two plus one and, tr- and just like it's infinitely quotable as well yeah. but the dialogue is so fast paced that i myself find that i don't quote as much of it as what other folks do mm-hmm. um like i i know our, our buddy darren from the psycho semantic podcast he and his wife apparently still quote that communism was just a red herring line uh, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. gets repeated depending upon which ending you're watching you know quite a bit too and it, we would be remiss if we don't talk about how infinitely quotable this dialogue is and how well written and funny a lot of this dialogue is because there's always these throwaway lines yeah. um and i my absolute favorite part is an improv improvisation that they weren't expecting and they had to work around and that's when model madeline Kahn was like yes i murdered her flames flames on the side of my face <laughs> i would be remiss if i don't mention that quote because that's like my favorite part of the movie i watch that twice yeah every time i watch it unless i'm watching it in like a screening <laughs> uh <laughs> And my wife and I did go to uh, the theater chain uh, Alamo Drafthouse Theaters, um, the local one that we have here in Omaha, uh, about a year or two ago, maybe three years ago, I think. They do these things called movie parties where it's people who are fans can go get together and they have like props that they'll give you to participate along with the movie. And uh, you can kind of cheer when your favorite character comes on screen and you can quote your favorite line as it's happening. You can't yell it out ahead of time or anything like that. But it's just kind of like a raucous good time for people that really want to watch the movie. And one of the things that they gave us was like these uh, pistols with bang caps. So every time a gun fires, you can oh, yeah. actually bang cap and pop a, an actual like bang pop gun <laughs> along with it to have. And it was deafening all these people shooting these things off at once, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's just a bunch of adults playing like kids uh, hitting each other with like uh, foam candlesticks and stuff that they handed us. Um, I got a wrench. My wife got a candlestick, I think, you know, that, that kind of thing. But the movie party was hilarious. All the people throwing out quotes and everything with it. And that was a ton of fun. And it was the first one that we had ever done like that. We decided to give it a try because we loved Clue. And uh, subsequent films that uh, we've gone back for include The Mummy, which has been covered here oh. on this show, famously with Kate Pollock. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, Kate talked about that. Yeah, I love that film. That's a very quotable film as well. Hello, Benny. Yeah. Good, goodbye, Benny. 
<laughs> right. So, I mean, it's the same kind of thing where yeah. you, you have the movie party and that's kind of what I think uh, really kind of represents what this movie can be because you could throw it on for a group of friends that have all seen it and love it and you have an instant movie party because you're just going to have a blast all watching it even in the background. Yeah. Um, another thing that's great for this is I like to fall asleep to this to this movie. I'll like let it play in the background and just kind of drift off because it's like comfort food for the, the brain mm -hmm. to watch it. And of course, you know, there's a lot of screaming and gunshots. So at some point you're always going to get constantly woken up. And those of us that are movie fanatics are always trying to squeeze in one more movie before we fall asleep. So that like drifting in and out of sleep while watching a movie that's comforting and familiar can be a really relaxing type thing. And that's kind of how I watched it last night, super late at night. I'll wake up and then back it up a little would watch it again you know or whatever and you're like trying to stay awake but you're sort of like halfway drifting off to sleep and that is like the best way to watch a movie because it kind of becomes part of your subconscious while you're sleeping too and it's really fun because you can kind of hear it in the background you yeah. know i know what you mean yeah you get the best sleep ever don't you with that you just fall asleep um going back to oh the, yeah um, the best i've ever slept as a kid is falling asleep watching a movie absolutely the best, uh, one of my favourite quotes is when he's, when he's saying, let me in, let me in, and they're like, let us out, let us out. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, where's the body? And he's like, there's nobody. There's nobody in the sort of dining room. And he's like, oh, these, these are... <laughs> he goes, no, there's nobody. Uh, nobody. There's nobody in the dining room. There's nobody in the dining room. And going back to that, it's always good to see um, leaving turn up in a film you know he really sort of captures a bit of presence doesn't he you know he just just looks menacing as hell around you know i love how instantly leaving is they like they show that he's like this dirty fighter and he uses his size to his advantage where the very first thing he does is kick somebody in the leg so they fall over so they're down to his height and then he punches them out yeah exactly you know i mean this is the second time we've spoken about leaving because the last show we did was streets of fire and uh, I think that was the other movie that he was in as well. He plays pretty much the same type of character. Uh, well, yeah, you just put someone like Lee Ving on screen, and all Lee Ving has to do is just look. Just look at somebody, and he's menacing his shit just because he has that look to him. Yeah, I, I, he looks, to me, he looks like a vampire. You know, it's like he's going to grow some veins. He'd be, he'd be really good in a... I, I wish I, he did more films, you know. You could see him playing like a... A vampire in a movie or something like that, you know? <laughs> yeah, I always see him as the cable man from uh, Something Wild, I think. It's not Something Wild. It's um, uh, The Wildlife with uh, Christopher Penn and uh, Eric Stoltz, where he's like their cable guy that oh, right. throws a party in their freaking apartment and destroys it. Okay, yeah, Christopher Penn. Yeah, I could see them, so I'll have to check that one out. I'm seeing that. Oh, uh, yeah. I covered that ages and ages ago on my podcast. The Wildlife is right up your alley. It's like 80s gloriousness. Um, picture like a breakfast club, only they're not in detention. You're just following them across, you know, their daily lives and somehow their lives all intersect and it's quite the cast. Sounds like a witch movie as well, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> Damien Burkett type of <laughs> go-to film. <laughs> Little shout out to him there. <laughs> You're going to have to edit out his actual name, but yes, it totally feels like a witch <laughs> film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm giving it away his name. Um... But um, the other person that turned up in this as well is a guy called Jeffrey Kramer. And I never realised this until this watch. He's the actual deputy from Jules. Um, he's the <laughs> guy whose bro car's broken down. And I thought, oh, I, I, I didn't realise until I <laughs> watched it this time around. I so. didn't realise that that was the, the motorist in Jaws. That's incredible. Yeah. Or the, yeah, he's the deputy in Jaws. So he's the guy that... He's the motorist that just shows up to make a call and then he ends up getting murdered because he's one of the people involved with Mr. Body in some way. Yeah, that's right. He basically plays the same sort of character. You know, he's like the sort of put, the put upon deputy. Uh, <laughs> the wonder what the fuck is going on in Amity. And you know, he's turned up in this house and he's wondering what the fuck is going on in this house as well. <laughs> um, and it, these are really nice little touches as well because it just releases from the crowd. So you've got all this going on and you've got other people that turn up as well, uh, like the police officer, the motorist. Um, and then obviously, okay, is it Paul de Abdul that turns up? Is it um, singer? Is it I am the singing telegram? No, no, it's... So, um... Oh, geez. Uh, is it one of the Go-Go's? I think it's... Is it the singer from the Go-Go's or something like that? Oh. It's a it's a pop musician of the time, but it's before Paula Abdul's time. I think she was still 
doing uh, choreography and stuff at this point before she had actually gotten uh, her singing career off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, is it the Go Go's or a Bangles singer? I somebody out there is screaming at us that, that oh, well, like, I can't uh, believe you don't remember. Well, I'll yes, tell you exactly that. This rock musician at the time. I'll tell you exactly that. Be, that that'll be Ricky Morgan shouting at me right now. Come on, RJ. <laughs> God damn you. <laughs> yeah, if there's an obscure '80s musician to reference, Ricky will know it, and he he'll will tell know. you it. He'll, he'll, he'll tell you in a split second. Um, yeah, I, I, I like those those moments, and this that's a particularly funny moment because our our group of uh, um, characters in this film have had so much go on. So many people have been murdered. When they go to look at all these bodies, they just open the door up and they look. They don't say anything, and then they just walk back out again then they <laughs> like oh there's another dead body it's like oh okay i just love the i just love the whole thing where i am the singing teller bang yeah that's they it, don't yeah. even let them finish because they're just so irritated by it all and uh one of my favorite scenes and it's like it, it, it the comedy in this is just it's it's easy comedy but it's very effective um where Tim Curry is like, I'm coming, I'm coming. And he's like, like in a dark room, all the lights have gone out. And he goes, oh, there's a handle. There's a handle. And he twists it and it's a shower. <laughs> it goes right into his face. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's just comedic timing at its best. Yeah, that's really kind of uh, an interesting way that they go about it. Um, okay, and it was a singer from the Go-Go's. It's Jane Weldon from the Go-Go's. So Jane Weldon, was... that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the Rush Hour. I, I, I had to look it up while you were kind of doing your, your little spiel there. I just, yeah, I had to, yeah, to, yeah. to do that. Yeah. Sorry, that's, I just wanted to interject that it was Jane Weldon. I forget where I was going with that for everything else. So there oh, we go. No, we can come back. Okay. We can yeah, try to capture right. something yeah, else yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then obviously we got everything else going on and then you got the, like the free endings to this film, um, which I think this goes back to what I said earlier. I, I still... Every time I watch the beginning of this film, I can't. It's really odd. I can't sort of recollect how the endings pan out, and I think that's very clever because it's just—it's almost like you're, you're you're left as a playing at like a new board game yourself with this movie. You know, you don't really know how it's going to pan out until you actually the watch the end. You know, the first DVD I had of this actually had a function where you could choose the ending, or mm. you could choose the ending at random, or you could choose all three. Like what it used to play on cable as yeah and uh that was one of the fun features for me i always like to choose the one at random uh -huh. you know and you can actually kind of see if you watch just the individual endings on their own how it all ties up and how it actually kind of works as a mystery and if you watch them all together which everybody tends to see them that way where they're all put together then it really kind of stretches out the hilarity of how they're trying to wrap up the various comedic pieces and how these various changes really kind of affect the way that the, the movie ends. And it's actually an interesting idea for a marketing campaign that they never really, you know, said uh, that that's what they were doing until after a, a while, like that they kind of cop to it. But depending upon the region you were in, that was the ending that you got so that, you know, if you started talking to somebody else from a different region, they would have a completely different ending and they could have had this work. Had they pulled it off, they could keep changing the endings yep. and just have this movie running for like ever where people would just be watching different endings. But it didn't really kind of work out that way for them. I think it kind of ended up biting them in the ass a little bit and ended up backfiring with the different endings. Yeah, it's like a lot of these things. I don't think people got that at the time, but I think today people might get that. So it'd be interesting to see if someone actually brings a film out with different en endings. Um well, that's what the choose your own adventure things that Netflix was playing around with, with the ah. uh, Balderdash and uh, the but, Kimmy Schmidt or whatever, where you could like make it end depending upon how you chose various things and go back and watch it, watch it multiple times. You doing a clue adventure like that, where you make the decisions by clicking on things mm -hmm. and a choose your own adventure style of watching like what Netflix has done. Man, people would probably eat that up. Who knows? Yeah, I think they did it with um, Black Mirror, didn't they? The, the Twilight Zone type um yeah, there was a black. I think it was Black Mirror Balderdash is what I was talking about. I think is oh, the name of it. It was based on a okay. video game. Yeah, and yeah, it was an interesting experience. But uh, I think it kind of was a little bit of a fad thing. So I think that's over with. I know Netflix hasn't really tried that again that I know of. Mm. Um, but I mean, that would definitely be something a streaming service could have fun with. 
Imagine doing Clue, but almost like the video board game style where, uh, like, you know, the, the VHS tapes where you would play, like, Nightmare or <laughs> oh, yes. or uh, yeah. Atmosphere or whatever where yeah. the guy's yelling at you. But instead, it's like the movie Clue, but you make the choices as to where they're going to go to investigate next. Ah, and either so, your character yeah, gets yeah, killed depending upon your decisions or, you know, you, you find another clue and you, you move on from there. I mean, I, I think that would be kind of a fun way to go about doing it. Did you have a favorite ending out of one of those three endings? Was there one where you thought, yeah, that's pretty cool? I'm such a Tim Curry fan. I love when he works with the FBI and busts everybody, mm. you know? Um, and anytime he says communism is a red herring at the very, like at some point, point during the speech, that's one of my favorite endings. I actually prefer watching them all in a row. And then um, I don't really like the one where Michael McKean's the FBI agent, but it's the only one where the very gross sort of cliched uh, stereotypical gay jokes that they do with him hmm. kind of feels okay because he's this, you know, super macho bullshit guy who's playing it up to make everybody else not suspect that he's an FBI agent. So that yeah. kind of makes it somewhat better, but it's still pretty gross. The <laughs> the cliche gay jokes that they, yeah, put in yeah, there yeah, with yeah, yeah. No, I get that. I mean, for me, the same as you, actually, the one with Tim Curry, where he's the guy who's basically outed, them all and i like it where you've got colonel oh was it um was it the one where he, he it's miss scarlet that's done it and then you've got colonel mustard with the chandelier that falls down behind him that's my favorite ending because i just think that way that chandelier just comes down and he goes whoa like that and i just think this is a great way to end this film um but <laughs> yeah you know, it's, it just it kind of just ties up everything that's kind of gone on in that film like everybody's just that one scene with a chandelier falling down behind you is kind of like what everybody's experienced in this film something that they didn't really expect was going to happen it's made them jump um so i thought that was that was quite a good ending um well like that and watching a chandelier fall right behind martin mall and scare the living shit out of him is just hilarious I too thought, i thought he was great as colonel mustard every time he had his bit of screen time i thought he was great he had a lot of conviction um, but he was a little bit clumsy at the same time, you know, where he opens up the cupboard and then the <laughs> the ironing board just hits him on the head. <laughs> it's like, well, everybody's uh, got those sort of pratfall comedic moments in there with the physical comedy that really just kind of breaks up the... There's always tension that you have to build with mystery movies and horror films. And the difference between comedy and horror is the tension relief usually in horror is a scream because something just startled you. Mm. Whereas in a comedy, you're laughing at something outrageous that happens. And the thing Clue does really well is combine the two so that someone is startled and you have a little bit of a scream, but it's because an ironing board falls out and hits the guy in the head when he opens up the cabinet. So it becomes this comedic scream laugh release all mixed together, yeah. which is so hard to do. But those moments like that, with the chandelier falling behind Martin Mall and him being terrified. And it is a scary moment because when it does happen, it does startle you. You don't expect it to happen. Yeah. And then boom, it happens. And it's it's one of those shocking moments. But because of the look on his face and because of how, like, you know, at his wits end and frayed his nerves are, it makes it that much funnier. And it gives you this moment of levity while at the same time being this brief moment of shock. Mm -hmm. And that is a really, really hard balance to hit. I mean, you, there's movies that fail miserably trying. And the sad thing about this not doing better than it did is this movie really works on that level really yeah. well, where it mixes those so perfectly. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's um, like the music in this film by John Morris. You've kind of got that instrumental, isn't it? That did 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 it, it, it's it, the Agatha Christie feeling of a score for an Agatha Christie adaptation book, but with a little bit more whimsical, uh, yeah. comedic flair to it. So it's it's not really parody. It's like um, it's like a it's like a tribute, but it it just definitely has a little bit more whimsy and sort of a fun side to it. Instead of it trying to build tension, it's trying to relieve tension, and it just has that. You know, just a little bit more upended ditty to it as yeah. opposed to the, the typical dun, 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 droning kind of thing with like a little bit of um, like a harpsichord playing or whatever that you'd expect from a mystery movie like this type to yeah, sort of bring in the atmosphere. 
because you've also got the bit at the beginning where you've they're, they're, they're approaching what looks like a haunted house, doesn't it? You know, with Christopher Lloyd and Miss Scarlet, and he goes, "Oh, I'm, you know, my, what's the matter with the car? It's frightened." And you've got that, um, and then, like, so what you just said there with them running around, and then you've got, um, I like it when uh, Wandsworth comes in, he's just trotting some dog shit, and he, which is a little gag. Um, and they, and, yeah, they carry that through the rest of the film. Anytime somebody walks past Wadsworth or Wadworth, Wadsworth leaves the room after talking to them, someone always goes, Yeah, that's it. It's a little snip, yeah. just a little tiny snip. And they just little references like that, little little audio jokes that uh, uh, things that I'm always missed, mm. you know, uh, like I mentioned with the soup slurping thing. But yeah, the, the, the sniffing at the shoe every time he walks past after he steps in. And he's so pleased with himself dealing with the dogs, like, you know, using the bones to subdue them and then. <laughs> yes like re resecuring their chain so it's shorter so that people can get to the door yeah. and then he just steps in like the only pile of dog shit that's there on that porch where they were at he just happens to step in it and i just love the look of, of tim curry rolling his eyes in disgust that this happened to him yeah and, <laughs> and then he, he walks through the door didn't he from that and then all of a sudden you've got the bill Heady shake a rattle and roll which I think really works well with the film because it just brings in a little bit of a sort of fun element to it. And you've got um, Yvette, um, who's cleaning, isn't she? And she's just sort of jiving around. And I just thought, that's, this, this kind of just feels The good. ladies in this film, I would not be court psyops if I did not <laughs> mention. <laughs> you, yeah. Yeah. Good Lord, Colin Camp as Yvette in this film. Yeah ushered me through a part of my childhood where I went from being a young boy who wasn't so interested in women <laughs> to being obsessed with Colleen Camp in the maid's outfit there. And I mean, Mrs. White, Miss Scarlet, uh, Leslie Ann Warren, and, and the various dress that she has as she comes in. I mean, like I was just obsessed with all of the ladies in this movie, except for Mrs. White. She terrified me. And I was like, I don't want to go yeah. anywhere near her. She kills every husband she's ever had. But like that black widow type character that they had her embody with the way that she's dressed and everything yeah. is is perfect and now that i'm older and I, I like a little danger with my with my life then i'm more interested in mrs white than i've ever been well yeah i can hear gary hill now always mention him every time with these <laughs> these types of scenes and this kind of goes on to the next bit when they got the police officer and they and um he walks into the room and you've got the uh crew cut song life can be a dream and they're basically, you know, uh, Professor Cl uh, Plum's getting his little bit with Miss Scarlet, isn't there? There's a little bit of upskirt there. <laughs> um, and then Miss White's uh, snogging Mr. Body, isn't she? You know, a little bit of necrophilia going on there. <laughs> well, what's funny is he's like, it's shocking, it's horrid. You don't want to go in there. This is wrong, blah, blah, blah. And he's trying to say, and the cop is like, no, this just looks like folks having a good time. I'm like, yeah. dude, if you knew the amount of dead people you're looking at right this instant. That's it. <laughs> it's just so clever how it just masks it all, doesn't it, very quickly. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's just a really good film. Every time I rewatch it, I just I look at these scenes and I think this is, this is very clever writing. It's very clever directing. Um, all the actors are playing their parts, so... Um, yeah, I just can't like it. Like you said earlier, you said you, you and I can just talk about this movie all day long, can't we? <laughs> it's, the, it's, the... Well, it's just all the elements just hit just right with uh, specifically, I think, for our generation of folks, mm. you know, like we just this was the right kind of thing to show up on TV to keep you interested. And it just has a cross section of things that could grab your interest at just whatever point. And I think the only thing that really kind of didn't hit with audiences was just the the fact that it just wasn't at the right place at the right time for the theaters but uh, when it stumbles into your life and you find it on cable or tv or whatever you know you become obsessed with it almost instantly upon watching it well i think sometimes um again uh, someone i was talking to at work um made a really good point saying that it came the problem with this film is it came out in 1985 and you look at all the other films that came out in 1985, just to mention a few, you've got Return of the Living Dead, you've got Back to the Future, you've got Team Wolf. Um, I, I could probably reel a, a load off, but it, it, it was just that there were so many other good films coming out that it, it was just, Clue was just trying to sort of work its way in there. Um, could have been one of the reasons why it didn't do very well commercially, because people had so much choice of films to go and watch at the cinema. Um it probably just got a little bit out, out ranked, but as it turns out, this is a really good film. 
which is it, I think I've heard this mentioned before a lot. It's, it's not until a film goes onto sort of home rent or VHS that it, it tends to find its audience. Um, again, we mentioned John Carpenter. I think uh, that's how JC ended up making his uh, career on a stable platform with VHS. Oh, or just uh, showing up on cable all the time. I mean, a good portion of John Carpenter's movies I watched a ton as a kid without even realizing they were the same guy. Yeah. You know? Oh, like, yeah. I just, yeah. I had no clue. And it wasn't until I started paying attention to directors' names. And what I realized was, like, you can kind of count on some people to consistently deliver you the same kind of entertainment. Mm. Um, you know, like, if you if you know a name, like, if you, you, like, I realized probably with John Carpenter that if you could recognize the name of a director, chances are, if you really liked some of their stuff, you would like all of their stuff, unless it was vastly different and weird. And some directors were like that. And, you know... Same thing with kind of Clue. You, you, you notice a, a name or two or you, you find an actor, specifically for actors with Clue. And then you know like, hey, if they're in this movie and I love them in this, then I'll give another movie a shot just because Tim Carrey's in it. And while that's a dangerous game of roulette, man, sometimes you get rewarded with some wonderful movies like Legend that are another yeah. type of film that just, you know, people acknowledge now. But at the time, were kind of miserable failures that nobody liked. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. Absolutely. Um yeah, some some directors have their their signatures, don't they, on on films, and you can just tell straight away. Um, oh, can't well, think yeah, of... just someone involved with a film puts their stamp on it in such a way that you know that you know you can go see a film just because this person's in it, and you'll probably like at least what they do in the film. Like I talked earlier with <laughs> with Tim Curry, I've watched plenty of turkeys just because he was amazing in it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it just draws you. I think there's um, another director that does that for me. It's the director of the Burbs. Funny enough. Um... Oh, Joe Joe Dante was probably the second director that I've been watching Joe Dante movies my entire life without realizing they were all the same guy. Yeah. You know, and then when I started getting the connective tissue of watching uh, how his career developed, I'm like, well, holy shit, Joe Dante has been my childhood. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I I, I spoke to um, Bo Ranzel about the Twilight Zone movie, and one of my favourite segments in that is uh, "It's a Wonderful Life" with the little kid that sort of retains his family in the home, and it all goes to shit with all that cartoon stuff. And as soon as I found out that was Joe Dante, now I know. I think yeah, this is definitely Joe Dante because he's kind of like the He's like the circus guy that will turn up and he'll all be very sort of, hey, come on in, and everybody will be going, oh yeah, this sound, this would be alright. And as soon as you're in there, it's like, ha ha, I've tricked you because, you know, I'm going to throw a few elements of horror in here and he can just screw things up a little bit. And there's a little bit of menace um, in there. Say like with the burbs and even Inner Space has got a little bit of, <laughs> a few fucked up elements to it as well, you know. Oh, uh, where uh, uh, Vernon Wells gets digested in the stomach using uh, the fact that he has an acid stomach, yeah, just by yeah. just just by getting his anxiety triggered and, and things like that. Yeah. yeah, horrific little things, and the fact that people get shrunk down to fifty percent and left there because they just they took the chips with them. That's like sort of like their punishment. Yeah, and so you you got Kevin McCarthy. We're doing a sideways loaded review of Inner Space. So what you have to have me back if you do Inner Space. I do love that movie. Oh, it's too. a good film. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like you yeah. say, it's, it's Joe Dante. He and I think that's primarily what he's done with the Burps. He is a very he's he's the guy who will take a kind of nicey nicey story and he'll just chuck little elements in there just to sort of tease you with a little bit of horror. Um, so yeah, and he's also oh god, my head's gone to pulp now. He's also got his go-to cameo guy um, that turns up as well. He's turned up in everything. I can't remember. Dick his Miller. Name. Yeah. Dick Miller. Dick Miller. Dick yeah. Miller's in everything. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I love. It. It, uh, one of the, one of the things that I had my my wife uh, recognize was whenever Dick Miller shows up, she has to know his name. I started awarding her points. Yeah. For uh, when we when we even just started dating for actors like Dick Miller or whatever. And Robert Picardo, and anytime they pop up on screen, you know she'll she'll name them off just to like tell me that that's who they are, as if I don't know. And it's super cute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like you know, always, always. This is another conversation I always have as well with films. Always to use uh, alternate universe. Now, I wouldn't do anything with Friday Night because it's a perfect film to me, and Roddy McDowell is absolutely brilliant. But I would love to see um, Dick Miller do a, a role in that as the Vampire Hunter. Do you know what I mean? 
working down some sort of hardware store saying, hey kid, yeah, I've got, I've got bow and arrows, I've got, uh, I've got silver bullets, you know, 20 bucks a pair, you know. Uh, so basically yeah, we'll you want that. Dick Miller from The Howling in Fright Night? Basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. I mean, you could have it that, you know, just change the synopsis that, you know, a kid's got a vampire living next door and he gets an occult bookshop owner to help him out. And I think that's definitely a film I'd love to see, um, you know, in my world. <laughs> I think it'll work. <laughs> I want an alternate history where Dick Miller ended up in Fright Night now, too. Thanks. <laughs> like, Fright uh, Night 2, Dick Miller would have been perfect. Like, they have to get help from Dick Miller in Fright Night 2, yeah, which I no, defend that movie, yeah, even though other people yeah, hate it. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah I, love, I love Dick Miller. Well, the late Dick Miller now, um, unfortunately. But he's definitely the guy I'd love to have as a neighbor as well. I think he'd just <laughs> have... If he was looking for something, Dick, have you got this? He goes, yeah, I've got it in the shed. You know? <laughs> it'd be one of those guys that's got ev- absolutely everything you need in the shed yeah. <laughs> wow we are really off field right now for Clue that's awesome sorry guys yeah that's it um, but this is it This is I love these tangents this is what it's all about but um, I think on that note cool. I think I think we've pretty much covered Clue here haven't we we've basically just come to the result saying this is a pretty decent film um, you haven't seen it go and check it out the fact that you haven't seen it, just flames, flames on the side of my face. <laughs> um, and remember, communism was just a red herring. Just a red herring. Yeah, I can totally see Darren Wilson using that quote as well. Yeah, now you mentioned it. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. Him and the missus that's, saying that back and forth, it just totally makes sense once you know Darren. Yeah. Uh, well, on that note, I think we'll end it on that. Um, cool. Um, before we end the show, I've always like to a uh, little bit of promotion for your show. Uh, I know your latest episode was Trauma, was it, from 1978? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Um, mm. That sounds about right. With That was the most recent one that was released to the Patreon feed. And as of thus recording this, it will be released to the main feed in the edited form. Uh, so the only difference really is for Legion Patreon subscribers, you get the way that I always intended to do the show, which is I pick uh, pop music or various types of popular music or just something that maybe fits along with the movie yeah. thematically wise or something like that. I used to do that in the olden days of the show before mm. uh, bots be scrubbing everywhere and, and flagging you for copyright infringement Yes, when uh, podcasting was the Wild West and you could get away with it. Yep. Uh, and being able to do that on the Patreon kind of brings some of the fun back to, to podcasting for me. And that's why I always talk about it. It's a pirate radio edit because it is copyright infringing, but it's on our Patreon. So the bots don't scrub there and I can get away with it. And then our main feed, I just replaced that that copywritten music that might get us flagged elsewhere with uh, just whatever uh, music is uh, royalty free or, or able to that we have some licensing for that we're able to have it on YouTube and things like that. So yeah. that's the main difference. And the main feed is going to probably be released sometime as of this recording today. And who knows? We're in the midst of Jello January and I'm doing four month, four weeks in the month instead of three uh-huh. <laughs> for Jello January. So it's... <laughs> Giallo Gen of February. Well, cool. Thank you very much for coming on to the show. It's always a blast when you come on. And um, I will put you down for Inner Space as another um, episode. I will be covering that film at some point. Bit of Joe Dante. Um, uh, basically, just a blanket statement here, RJ. When you think of Joe Dante, you think of Court Psyops because I will give you my all on any Joe Dante movie. Even Looney Tunes back in action. That's how I roll. <laughs> well, that seed's now planted in my head, so... <laughs> Uh, okay, cool. Well, thanks very much, buddy. Um, all right, and people, well, listen, um, before I close the show up, oh, a little bit of admin for the show, I'm a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows on there, including Court Show, the um, Cinema Science uh, Podcast. Uh, you can find Bite Size Cinema on iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, several other players if you uh, type in bite size cinema into google it takes you somewhere where you can listen to the show we also have a facebook page which is the best place that you can contact me to say what i've done right and what i've done wrong with the show <laughs> i'm open to any sort of feedback um and yeah that's about it guys so as always keep it bite size keep it safe and i'll see you soon <laughs>
If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. The Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.